Well, I want to welcome you to our UN um, Day of Tolerance and celebration of our diversity here at Raritan Valley Community College. Uh, my name is Richelene DeShields. I'm the Dean of Multicultural Affairs. And I'd like to um, welcome our president, President Madonna, just to bring words of welcome. And Oh, he's just waving in the back. Okay, he's just going to wave in the back. Great. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to all the different academic departments, um, student clubs, um, and offices who have participated in the program. This, excuse me, guys, if you could kind of come to the center, thank you. This is our fifth year of having the program. The first year, actually, we started um, with a DNA project. And if you look in the back, um, as representative of our students and our faculty and our staff and educators in the community, the following year, we talked about inclusiveness. Um, the last year, we talked about um, collaboration and partnership. And this year, we're talking about in search of our humanity. You know, um, I would wish that for the world, a position like mine was not needed. But in 2016, even more so, multicultural affairs is even more relevant um, today than it's ever been. Being able to have skills um, and cultural competency, be able to build relationships um, across borders, to be able to open up your heart, just to be able to treat each other with respect, is definitely something that I think we all value and we appreciate, but that we really should have a moment just to be reflective and be aware of how I can even be better at that. You know, each day I strive, each day I learn something from my students. You know, um, whether or not they're in my office or I see them around the campus, I learn from you every day. And it challenges me to even be a better person each and every day. So I just want to say thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, thank you for all your contributions, too, as well. I know that in um, the spring we have a collaborative program for all the cultural clubs are participating in the um, culture shock, and we also have this year our first annual powwow. I'm going to bring up Patrick just to talk a little bit about that before we introduce our speaker. So, um, Patrick, please come forward. I want to say thank you so much for inviting us to be here today. My name is Patrick Little Wolf Brooks. I represent Ravenwings Production. Uh, we are a humongous Native American education group that travels all over the world to educate about Native American um, issues that are going on in our communities. All too often do colleges and institutions forget about Native people. We're called Native Americans, but unfortunately, we're the last American people thinks about. And when it comes to diversity, Native people represent the four colors. And what those four colors are, black, red, yellow, and white. And those four colors represent all nations of people coming together as one. And I think I can speak for everyone to say RVCC is definitely on that track. We have a humongous diversity department here that really cares and understands. I can vouch for that. When I first come here and I seen there was no representator, a representation for Native American people, just walking up to Mr. Shields, instead of saying, tough, get over it, she looked at me and said, well, what can we do to fix it? That's the only thing she was worried about. She wanted to come together. Now we have a great new president here that's striving to even make it even better. He's now invited my dance troupe along with all other Native Americans all over the country, almost 300 dancers in total, are coming from all over the United States and Canada to come here at RBCC to give you a little taste of our culture on April 9th. I'd love for everyone to come out and to attend. I'm always looking for volunteers also to be able to enjoy my people's food, our culture, and represent what RVC has been doing for so long, and that's bringing all of us together, not by color, but as blood. Because it ain't about race, it's about the human race. And when you cut us all, we're all one. Thank you.
So each um, week um, during February, we have um, strived to um, have a variety of programs for um, Black History Month. Um, we started out with community activists. We had a scholar um, and feminist from um, Rutgers University. And this week, we have the UN program as well as the Phi Theta Kappa um, Leadership Series, too. And so um, I just wanted to be able to um, share with you and ask um, for everyone to just rise. We're going to watch um, a video um, for Lift Every Voice and Sing. You can sing, too, as well. And I'll give you a hint. If you go in the archives of the podcast that Multicultural Affairs has done in the past, one of the archives has me singing. So I now have a video, and I step away from the mic because I'm not a singer, too, as well. So um, enjoy um, the historical um, presentation um, of African Americans and their contribution to America. So as we celebrate the United Nations Day of Tolerance, it's built around one simple concept, the concept of respect, right? If we can respect each other, our differences, we can find ways that we can bridge and build um, um, commonality along with our um, similarities that we have. We're honored today to be able to have one of our national um, um, leaders here in New Jersey, um, Dr. Um, Reverend Dr. Victor Arroyo, Jr., who currently serves as the Chief Diversity Administrator and Director of Multicultural Relations at Princeton. Um, he is responsible um, to directly to the president for the seminary on matters of diversion and inclusion, diversity and inclusion. Um, Victor has um, developed a variety of initiatives um, across the spectrum of institutional inclusion. Um, before his role um, as director, he served as a director of vocation, um, where he was staff um, in charge with the admissions process and the selection of um, master's candidates in that role. He also has served um, for 15 years as chair of the Diversity Action Blueprint and Steering Committee. He has worked on a number of um, programs um, navigating the Waters Initiative, he has his bachelor's degree and a master's degree um, from Princeton Theological Seminary and a doctor in higher education administration from the University of Pennsylvania. Specifically, his dissertation title was Navigating Diversity Through Social Justice Imperatives in a Theological Institutions, a Ministry Model. So without further ado, I'd like to be able to bring forward Dr. Aloyo um, to be able to share remarks on this important topic of In Search of Our Humanity. Thank you. Well, friends, good afternoon. It is certainly a pleasure and a privilege of being here with you and to share in this wonderful day. It, it is great joy to see and to experience the multiplicity of, of uh, posters and banners that represent the cultural realities here of this fine institution. And I'm grateful uh, to be a part of this series of celebrations throughout the course of this month and as well throughout the course of the academic year. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity as well for the invitation extended by Dean DeShield uh, to have this opportunity to speak on the topic of In Search of Our Humanity. Uh, friends, I am also grateful uh, that uh, uh, I have three of my parishioners as I am, a, I also serve as pastor of the Iglesia uh, Nuevas Fronteras and the United Presbyterian Church in Plainfield, New Jersey, and three of our young adults are here in this uh, in this uh, fine institution, and I'm grateful that uh, one of them is here. I'll check out the other two later. Uh, <laughs> but uh, as as Dean the Shield mentioned, uh, there is this hope, right that that. Uh, offices of multicultural relations or offices of institutional diversity and, and of inclusive excellence uh, should not exist. 
Uh, first of all, it should just simply exist with the reality of individuals participating within institutions of higher education and looking at the realities of what uh, is available uh, for all people, right? And, and it's important for us to strive to a particular goal. And so in examining this particular uh, theme in search of our humanity, I, I found that, that it is imperative to look at what does that mean. Uh, I, I, I like the fact that it is an action verb that we're searching for, that it's a constant uh, opportunity to examine and explore relationships and possibilities and to understand each other's stories. So today, uh, for this four-hour presentation, what I'm going to be doing is to share... <laughs> is to share, uh, don't, don't, don't let me go there, I preach. Uh, I, I want to share with you uh, the reality, friends, that, that it's not about policies and regulations. It's not about what the federal government stipulates on, on matters of, of, of equality, such as the, the Educational Amendment Act of 1972 that speaks about Title IX and, and matters of um, that uh, that gender issues shouldn't be a shouldn't be an obstacle to access for for education, or the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that speaks about matters of discrimination and racism and issues of of uh, uh, mental or, or physical uh, uh, challenges or or what we call differently abled individuals to have access to education. It's, it's about relationship building, right? It's about the opportunity that what you're learning here, friends, and the various disciplines that we have is to enhance our abilities to relate with one another. Many times the discriminatory, discriminatory practices and issues of prejudices and issues that, that plague our society is because we set a certain bar of expectation based on assumptions instead of based on realities of human relationships. And so, so the, the reality is that we need to examine that humanity and its existence is based upon the fact that we are created not to be alone in this world. We are created to have relationships. We are created to understand each other's Differences and variety instead of looking at differences as an obstacle because we want things to be the same. So what I would like to, to do is to share with you a, a, a poem to kind of set the, the, the pace for, our, for this presentation today. And no, it's, it's not going to be for hours. Um, it will be a little bit, sh a little bit shorter than that. But if, friends, if I can share with you this poem, and 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 if you can just imagine the imagery, all right, of the words of this particular poem. Watch your step. The patio tiles are still a bit damp from the dew. Look over there. There, in the middle of the patio floor, over there. Try shielding your eyes from the bright morning sun. Look there. Isn't that mosaic incredible? Look at the brilliant colors, at the remarkable shading, the sunshine splashing on the distinct edges of the pieces makes the light dance. What an amazing visual feast, such careful crafting, each piece so beautifully different in itself, and yet fit together so artistically. Can we linger for a while longer? I want to take in the richness of this mosaic to absorb the colors and textures. I want to feel the subtle yet bold qualities that carry me into such a vastly different and wonderful world. Close your eyes. Close your eyes for just a moment. Take in the shades, the textures, and shapes of this mosaic. Take a deep breath. Slowly open your eyes and begin to take in the vision of each other. 
Look around you at our various shades, textures, and shapes. Feel the complexity of our diverse heritage. That is what makes us a humanity worth striving to exist for. That each one of us brings to the table a variety of gifts, a variety of shapes and sizes, a variety of stories that as Miroslav Volf mentions in his book, The Embrace of the Other, that I can't fully be me if I don't know the full you. And so it is an act, friends, of of it, it is a constant act. It's a it's it's a it's a verb, right? It's an opportunity to to see that in our own existence, we need to strive to get to know one another in order to live this life, this life that is filled with rich textures and tapestries of which we ought to of which we ought to cherish. And so I come to you this afternoon. Just to lay out a couple of challenges before us, I have, spoke, I have talked to several of you, and many are graduating this year, this semester, and going on to a particular, uh, uh, to another institution. Uh, congratulations on that amazing milestone. Give each other a hand. I think that that's wonderful. Continue to go forward. Uh, and there are those that are starting. And... If there's anything that I would like to share with you, it's just a a few words of encouragement. First, in order to be encouraged, we need to understand the realities. And now I'm not standing here before you assuming that I know your particular realities. Because you live them. You experience them. But I would like to encapsulate them in a particular framework today so that we can have some form of strategy as we move forward. Because you need to have a strategy. You need to be able to understand the travails of what is going to exist within this journey of life that you will be embarking upon. As I contemplated on the verbiage of this topic, the context of where we live, the target population of this such amazing institution doing wonderful work to educate and to provide access to many individuals within this particular area. And the realities of today's challenges, it came to mind a certain proverb of the Bantu people of Cameroon, West Africa. The proverb says the following, those who never, never visit think that mother is the only cook. Those who never visit think that mother is the only cook. It implies that persons who do not leave the familiarity of their own culture have difficulty conceiving of any reality outside of their own. It also suggests the need for a new attitude that is not threatened by the presence of difference and that honors and respects the diversity and the giftedness of others. Within these words, we find a message that speaks to the current challenges found in the topic of today in search of our humanity. So I come this afternoon with a particular hypothesis that our humanity is composed of a myriad of stories that are experienced on this journey of life, composed of political and social systems, cultural norms, religious values and practices, philosophical ideals, and other realities that make us a rich mosaic of infinite possibilities. These elements do not exist to keep us apart. These elements should exist to bring us and to bring us together, to draw us together, to understand that there's value that each one of us brings to the table. Yet instead of lifting our difference as blessings or as items that we are to cherish, that make our humanity flourish, we look upon this diversity as a mode for hostility, a mode for rage, a mode of fear, which is mostly manifested in unjust educational policies, 
unjust immigration laws, and ridiculous political rhetoric that spews venomous ideologies aimed at undermining the beauty of our humanity. You all hear what I'm saying? In order to develop this hypothesis, allow me to, to share my story. Friends, I am, I am the son... I am the son of Esperanza and Victorino Aloyo. Um, that's a picture of me. <laughs> I was a young child. <laughs> and who came to the mainland from Puerto Rico seeking to provide for the development of a family with greater resources. They came in the early 1940s. And these two individuals struggled with the malaise of, of discrimination at so many levels while building a successful business in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn, New York. I was born in Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, New York. They, my mother and father, epitomized many levels or the plight of hard-working immigrant families who struggled against the odds of being in a culture that was other than their own. They arduously worked in developing a faithful clientele by respecting the needs of the community where their business unfolded. Esperanza and Victorino Aloyo also cultivated their faith in God, who sustained their efforts throughout many difficult and violent moments in their lives. Friends, and to share part of that story, I need to share, right, the particularities of what I am talking about. So at the age of 12, when, my, when I came out of school, my father wanted to teach me about matters of responsibility. About assuming that certain value points in this life. So he asked me to come. No, he didn't ask me. He told me to come to the business three days out of the week in order for me to learn about the practice of responsibility. So one day I come and it's around 4.30 or so. I've already been in the, it was a supermarket. I was already in the supermarket for an hour or so. I'm there stocking up the shelves. And before I knew it, I started hearing gunshots. And when I looked at the direction of the entrance to the supermarket, there were these two individuals masked and shooting directly at my father. When someone does something like that, what do you do? Especially if it's your father or mother. You run towards that direction. You want to know what's going on. So I went there. They left. My father was dodging and moving around and throwing things and, and so forth just to avoid getting, getting struck. Unfortunately, he got hit. As he's laying there, there in, on the floor with his head on my lap, and I am just cr crying and sobbing incessantly because I saw the blood just spewing from the back of his shoulder blade. And as I see this going on, he just holds on tight to me because he knew for some reason or another that I was going to go and chase after the individual. The persons. The cowards. That had to use a mask. But he held on to me. And where he was at, at that moment... Not knowing what his status was, not knowing where, where or, or how that injury was going to impact him, he said to me words that have impacted me and has served as, as my mantra, has served as my ability to move forward. He says to me, don't hate. Don't hate. And he's just holding me right here in my heart. And he was just saying, don't hate. Hey, keep learning. Be the change. That impacted me so much. Because even in the midst of where he was, 
he was teaching his son. He was able to move forward. He was able to, uh, to recover. Unfortunately, the three shots that, uh, that went into his body, they were able to recover two of the bullets and remove them. One, they couldn't because it was just so intertwined with nerves that they left that there, and unfortunately, it impacted his right arm. And what impacted me the most was that after he recovered, after three months of rehabilitation, he comes back and works an additional 10 years in that same community. Standing up because he had developed such a relationship with that community that he felt obligated and as well thankful to be serving that community with what he was able to provide. So this is this man. This is part of my story. And that story has allowed me to build a particular framework. Yet it's paradoxical that in the midst of being kind of the receptors of antagonism through racial micro and macro aggressive tendencies from the dominant culture, their integrity was never shaken. And they provided their only son, their only child, an invaluable example, friends, of perseverance and commitment to an ideal of going forward and learning more, not only about the disciplines that one finds in an educational system, but utilizing those disciplines in the practice of life. Humanity. There's good in humanity. Yet we don't have to look far to realize that we're living in a society where incidents right, involving race have impacted college campuses across the country, from the racist chant of the University of Oklahoma to the suspension of Pi Kappa Phi fraternity in North Carolina State University after the discovery of a pledge book containing racially and sexually offensive language to the discovery of a noose in front of the Multicultural Center at Duke University Such incidents have become more common due to the debate on immigration, police brutality, and an African-American president in the White House, said Mary Beth Gassman, an expert of diversity in higher education at the University of Pennsylvania. The discussion on the role of education in strategies against poverty and exclusion and in the promotion of active citizenship is resurfacing resurfacing in a context, friends, of a global economic crisis challenging the capacity of nations to guarantee the provision and regulation of public services. In this context, the question of what kind of education and for whom is increasingly pressing, particularly in the North American experience in a context where our society is becoming more and more pluralistic with families and peoples from all over the world. And I find that that is an amazing and wonderful opportunity of growth. And so the world, friends, is becoming, I wanted to share as well, so they came, my parents came from uh, Vieques, Puerto Rico, which is an island on the, on the east coast of Puerto Rico. Um, uh, if you ever want to go on a vacation, it's a nice place. Uh, and they, and this is my, my family. I have two daughters, uh, Kayla and Alyssa, and my wife, um, Suzette. And that's my mom, Esperanza. My father passed away in 2005, and so my mom lives with us, and she is uh, a cancer survivor, and uh, for the past 12 years, uh, she has been chemo and radiation free, so I'm grateful for that. In order to search for humanity, let's survey the land a little bit. 
The world is becoming inescapably connected and interactive, friends, with a plurality of people, of ideologies, of backgrounds and orientations. Ethnic violence, religious conflicts, struggles for sovereignty, and urban unrest have both local and global implications outside the walls of higher education. But yet within those walls, long-standing issues of inequity along lines of race and of gender and of class and sexual orientation regarding access to uh, and representation in higher education is an ongoing concern to many scholars across the land. Today we are experiencing drastic and unbelievable change that we too need to come to understand in order for us to search for our humanity. Let's examine a bit of the time of which we are living. At the turn of the 19th century, the world's most developed and powerful nation was who? The turn of the 19th century. Huh? England. Did somebody say England? Yes, England. At the turn of the 20th century, the world's superpowers were which two countries? Russia and the U.S. Okay? And who knows what the future will hold, but it looks like the world's powers and influence is shifting again. The most populated country in the world is China with 1.3 billion people. India is not far behind with 1.2 billion. The United States is a distant third with over 320 million people. But that alone, friends, is, is, is itself doesn't mean much. But listen to these figures. The top 25% of the Chinese with the highest IQ is greater than the population of the United States and Canada combined. And that means that China has more honor students than we have students. Within our lifetime, China will become the number one English-speaking nation in the world. Today, the United States is the second largest Spanish-speaking nation in the world behind Mexico. In the next five minutes, 60 babies will be born in the United States, 244 in China, 351 in India, and this happens every five minutes of every day. According to the former Secretary of Education, Richard Riley, the top 10 jobs that will be in demand in the year 2020 did not exist in 2008. So that means that we are currently preparing students for jobs that don't yet exist using technologies that haven't yet been involved or invented. And in order to solve problems, we don't even know our problems yet. Not only is the world and technology changing, it is changing our culture as well. Today, one out of every six couples getting married in the United States met online. As of the fourth quarter of 2015, Facebook had 1.59 billion monthly active users. If Facebook were a country, it would be the most populated country in the world. (laughs) There are 9.7 billion searches performed on Google every month. There are more text messages being sent and received every day than there are people on the planet Earth. Not only is the world changing, but change is happening more rapidly than any time in history. In fact, scientists refer to the change taking place today as exponential change. Here are some examples. When Shakespeare wrote his great works, there were about 100,000 words in the English language. Today, there are more than 550,000 words, more than five times as many during the days of Shakespeare. More than 3,000 books are published daily. The Sunday morning edition of the New York Times contains more information than a person was likely to come across in their entire lifetime in the 18th century. It is estimated that 1.5 exabytes, in other words, 1.5 times 10 to the 18th power of new information is generated each year. 
That is more information than the previous 5,000 years combined. And the amount of new technical information is doubling every year. This means that a freshman entering college this year, half of what they learn in their freshman year will be outdated by their third year in school. Change is all around us. Change is everywhere. Science continues to change. Education continues to change. Technologies continue to change. Medical science continues to change. And if we believe, friends, that once you've obtained a document from this school or any other school that says you have a particular degree and that learning stops, you are gravely mistaken. Learning continues and you need to acknowledge that reality. Because these changes impact our value systems. These changes impact our cultural realities. And so as our cultures are constantly changing, it also impacts our worldview. It impacts how we interpret certain things. It impacts how we interpret our religious practices, our philosophical ideals, how we examine our careers and our vocations. So in order for us to recognize that, friends, isn't it imperative that in, in the act of searching for our humanity, that we constantly have an opportunity to dialogue with each other, because in that dialogue, we will be learning. I was just going to say amen, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, 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 but you all hear what I'm saying? In other words, we, we need to understand right, the plight and the wonderful opportunities that exist. The bottom line is that unless our strategies in human relationship building changes to make and to have effective dialogue and effective conversations, unless our leadership in education and higher education in particular are willing to examine culturally sensitive pedagogy that embrace the unique characteristics of our students Students that are change agents today, for the present and for the future of humanity, unless we recognize that we will then be producing culturally irrelevant leaders for an emerging world. Do you want to be a part of that legacy? I don't want to be a part of that legacy. I want to continue to learn and advocate for tools by which dialogue can be effective so that we can learn and combat the assumptions that unfortunately plagues our society. And unfortunately, there are systems that want you believe, want you to believe what they say so that you can continue, right, to have animosity, so that you can continue to be fearful for the things that you do not know. Friends, no instead of living in a realm of do not know. You all hear what I'm saying? So, at the end of the day, we're all human beings. And perhaps it is time we all realize this and really thought about what it means. Human beings are all beautiful, intelligent, passionate, loving, and most importantly, we were born to this earth with the inalienable right and purpose to live abundantly and contribute to the well-being of creation with the talents and gifts that you all have been given, that you all have, and that you all have in order to contribute to one another. The potential of humanity is unlimited, and by dividing ourselves, we are distancing ourselves from the possibility of fulfilling this potential. You have the ability. We have the ability together. And in search of our humanity, it is imperative that we understand these particular understandings. And I want to leave with this. I want to leave with two, with two statements. And I promise I won't be like, some preachers that say that they're going to be over in the last point and take another 30 minutes. I promise you, Dean. 
This is a question that I ask, I ask of you all. How can we foster and cultivate a humanity that values the richness of difference as a means to understanding the viability of our commonality? Let me repeat that. How can we foster and cultivate a humanity that values the richness of difference as a means to understanding the viability of our commonality. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stated this, our goal is to create a beloved community and this will require a qualitative change in our souls as well as a quantitative change in our lives. Similarly, a few thousand years before, Confucius said, to put the world in order, we must first put the nation in order. To put the nation in order, we must put the family in order. To put the family in order, we must cultivate our personal life. And to cultivate our personal life, we must first set our hearts right. Powerful. Broke it down. That in order for me to search for our humanity, I must know where I stand. And if I'm only doing things to follow, friends, what someone from a pulpit or a lecture says to me, and I don't question, then I am being irresponsible because my my purpose is to set my heart straight in order to build a beloved community. And so, continue going forward, friends. Continue to understand the dual nature of our existence. To learn and to act. It's constant on this journey of life. Thank you so much for this opportunity.